everyone. Welcome to the Free Church Hampstead Garden Suburb for this short act of worship comprising readings and prayers and a short reflection. I want to begin by reading these words, familiar words, that we find in Psalm 121, the 121st Psalm. If I lift my eyes to the hills, where shall I find help? My help comes only from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot stumble. He who guards you will not sleep. Guardian of Israel never slumbers, never sleeps. The Lord is your guardian, your protector at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you against all harm. He will guard your life. The Lord will guard you as you come and go, now and forevermore. Let us pray together. And we thank you, O God, for the reassurance we find in your word that whatever our situation or circumstance, you are there for us. You are our guardian. You are looking out for us. You will not allow us to stumble or fall. You never slumber or sleep, never caught unawares, always there for us whenever we might turn to you. And so we come now with confidence, turning to you, sharing ourselves with you, as surely as you would share yourself with us. We ask your blessing upon this short act of worship, that in and through the Holy Spirit you would inspire our words and our thoughts, our prayers and our reaction. We thank you that you are forever active in your world, ever active in the life of your people, ever active in our lives. Bless us now, O oh God, as we share one with another, wherever we are, whatever the time, wherever the circumstance. Share yourself with us as we share with one another and consecrate our worship, we pray, and do it for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to read a well-known passage that we find in the Gospel recorded by John. It's chapter 3, third chapter of the Gospel of John. One of the Pharisees, called Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, he said, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform these signs of yours unless God were with him. Jesus answered, in very truth I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he has been born again. But how can someone be born when he is old? asked Nicodemus. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, In very truth I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born from water and spirit. Flesh can give birth only to flesh. It is spirit that gives birth to spirit. You ought not to be astonished when I say, you must all be born again. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born from the Spirit. How is this possible? asked Nicodemus. You, a teacher of Israel, and ignorant of such things, said Jesus. In very truth I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, and yet you all reject our testimony. If you do not believe about the things of heaven, no one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, 
the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, in order that everyone who has faith may in him have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who has faith in him may not perish, but have eternal life. It was not to judge the world that God sent his Son into the world, but that through him the world might be saved. No one who puts his faith in him comes under judgment, but the unbeliever has already been judged because he has not put his trust in God's only Son. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The people prefer darkness to light because their deeds were evil. Wrongdoers hate the light and avoid it for fear their misdeeds should be exposed. Those who live by the truth come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that God is in all they do. And we thank God for his word. One of the richest chapters in the whole of scripture. There is a depth there which we can never reach the bottom of. There is much to be mined concerning the gems of truth that is placed within those words. So, to continue the metaphor tonight for a few moments, barely scratching the surface as we look at what is contained there. Tomorrow, 21st of December, the winter solstice, or what we might more popularly know as the longest night, the shortest day. From tomorrow onwards, the nights begin to draw out two minutes a day, apparently. And this will continue right through to June the 21st, the summer solstice, when we will arrive at the shortest night and the longest day. In truth, winter has been kind to us thus far. The weather has not been too inclement, and even though the days of light have been shortening nevertheless we have been able to enjoy much of the sunshine that watery sunshine that has been round and about us but there's something about the shortness of the day the length of the night that we find difficult to cope with emotionally as the darkness closes around us, we feel somehow hemmed in, wrapped up against ourselves. All the more mysterious, all the more concerning as we look out on the blackness of the sky. In the creation story, we are told that God separated night from day. Darkness was night, light was day, but in order to illuminate both, he placed great lights, the greater light, the sun, for the daylight, the lesser light, the moon, to light our way at night. Even in the midst of the darkness, God is lighting the way for us, that we might find our way through it. And Nicodemus comes to God by night, we are told. I've just been reading a book about the life of Thomas Cromwell and his influence on the English Reformation and came across a word that I'd never found previously, Nicodemites or Nicodemites, a word used to describe those of the Church of Cromwell's day who, to all intent and purpose, remained traditionalist, but secretly had converted to the Protestant cause. They had hidden the change for fear of the retribution of the king and the authorities. 
They have hidden themselves in the darkness of the night. They had come by night. Nicodemus, a secret believer, someone who wanted to know more, sufficiently intrigued by what Jesus had to say, to wonder aloud if he really was the one who was promised. He engages Jesus in conversation concerning this, that and the other. And Jesus pulls him up short by saying to him, in effect, Nicodemus, it's not about intellectual speculation. There's more to it than this. Unless you were born again, you cannot have insight into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, almost sarcastically in his response, says, What? How can someone return to their mother's womb a second time to be born? He wasn't asking it as a genuine question. It was a throwaway remark, as I say, a hint of sarcasm. But Jesus doesn't take the bait. He merely reinforces what he had said to him. You should not be surprised that I tell you, you should be born again, born of water and the spirit. The flesh gives birth to flesh, yes, but only the spirit gives birth to spirit. To speak of being born again, a phrase that's passed into disrepute in many circles. It's been used as a way of poking fun at some within the Christian community, born again Christians. But the baby should not be thrown out with the bathwater. All of us needs to have that sense of a spiritual insight if we are to properly follow in Jesus' footsteps. It's not enough to assent to the proposition that yes, he is the Son of God, the promised Messiah, to tick a box, as it were, without that meaning anything to us. It's not sufficient to acknowledge him to be a good man, a moral teacher, someone who had fine things to say, and if we all followed in the way he taught, the world would be a better place, even though it would be. Because in our own strength, that is an impossible task. But if we are prepared to acknowledge that we need to engage with God spiritually, and it is in Jesus that this opportunity is presented to us, then by virtue of that spiritual encounter, we will find the strength to live the moral life. And we will come to appreciate the intellectual dimension that attaches not that you have to be clever but you have to be wise wise unto salvation and so we confront tomorrow the shortest day by the middle of the afternoon night will have fallen but then the following day almost imperceptibly the day will have lengthened and within a few weeks we would have noticed we would have claimed back an hour or two of daylight and all might appear different. Of course, there's a sense in which the world in which we live today, our own particular communities, there is a darkness of a different kind enclosing us. The pandemic is getting worse before it gets better. And many of us are finding ourselves having to experience restrictions we never thought we would. Christmas is a difficult time this year. The vaccine is being rolled out and yes, I guess we all know of folk who've been called and received the first dose. But there's a lot of us and some of us are way down the queue. So we have to be patient. It's often said the darkest hour is just before the dawn. It's as if that's the case with what is happening. We're facing the darkest hour, but the dawn is about to break. And so in that spirit, I commend this Christmas tide to all of us, 
The light is shining in the darkness. The darkness will not be allowed to overcome it, whatever that darkness might be. God bless you all. And in that spirit, let us bring our prayers to God. Gracious, merciful and loving God, we thank you for your gift to us and to the world, your eternal Son, to be for us Saviour and Lord, this Jesus of whom we speak. We thank you that once again we can celebrate his coming into the world. We will hear familiar stories familiar songs and hymns, the same old story, but forever new, born again into our hearts, born again into the world. For this we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, that each one of us has been given the opportunity to be born again, to be brought into a relationship with you that is defined spiritually. The mystery of faith which unfolds as that relationship takes hold. Yes, for many of us it's been a long journey and not an easy one. The journey of faith. But you have remained faithful. The light has never been extinguished. You have never left us completely in the dark. For this we thank you. We thank you for the likes of Nicodemus who came to you by night, seeking you out in secret, and for the way in which Jesus was prepared to illumine his life by causing light to shine in his heart. We pray for all who even this day are seeking you out by night for fear of whoever. We pray for our country at this time, for those in positions of leadership and authority, for those who have the responsibility of administering the rules and the regulations, of enforcing what needs to be done. No easy task for them. We pray for all who work in the National Health Service as once again it teeters on the brink of being overwhelmed. We thank you for the dedication of doctors and nurses and all others who work within the National Health Service. We pray for our loved ones, those whom we thought we would be meeting with over these next few days, and who from now we must remain apart. Pray for them where they are and us where we are. And that by whatever means we might be able to engage with them, even at a distance. And we pray for ourselves, that we might know your blessing in our lives, your peace, your security, that your light would ever be shining. Do this, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this short act of worship. Just to say that this coming Friday, Christmas Day, there will be a service broadcast from the church at 11 o'clock in the morning. And then next Sunday, again at 11 o'clock from the church and at 6.30, this short act of worship. And that will contain a do-it-yourself communion. But until then, please stay safe and keep well and the compliments of the season be with you all. Amen.